Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Non-Aggression Parenting Podcast, Episode 2, uh, with my co-host, Melissa Rakovich here. And this episode, we have a, um, a guest, Jim Limber Davis, coming in from Indiana. Um, you can find his work on jimlimberdavis.com. And he's the author of, uh, of two ebooks, Liberty Defined and Morality Defined. And he's also the, um, the co-host of a podcast I do with him called Philosophy of Voluntarism. So I keep busy. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're going to have him on to talk about uh, the subject of today is talking to kids about death and uh, letting go of fear. And um, I think uh, it's kind of an interesting Interesting topic because uh, lately my four-year-old daughter has been uh, having some uh, morbid thoughts about death and growing old and getting weak and and decrepit and things like that, fun things like that. <laughs> um, and actually, um, just like yesterday, um, she was telling my, my wife that she's uh, very much afraid of... Um, First of all, she said she's afraid of zombies, like everyone's going to turn into a zombie. And then she said um, she has bad thoughts about my wife, about Ma- Monica. And she said she the thoughts are that she wants to hurt Monica, and, which is so weird. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah, she said that. And she was crying as she was saying that. Like She's like, I don't want to hurt you, but my, my thoughts are telling, you know, I have bad images. And so maybe we're thinking like something she saw, like, you know, a cartoon or um yeah something like that on through netflix some sort of influence maybe um yeah and so um but i thought that was interesting and, and my wife said you know you don't have to do it you know you don't have to do that you know just take it out of your mind just erase it and she's like i can't do that um but but you know she has a problem much more than my six-year-old son he doesn't really have those kind of um thoughts at all he, like he's never really talked much about death at all so it's kind of interesting. It's not really an age thing, you know. So I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> so, so what's your uh, what's your experience, uh, Melissa? Well, it's funny. My daughter, we have our daughters are the same age. Um, I think they're like two weeks apart. Also, four years old. And right. she lately, in the last three months or so, has been asking about death or what happens. And well, you know, she'll ask about like my grandmother, and she'll see pictures of her. And well, where is she? Where does she live? You know, and mm-hmm. and so there, there's always those kinds of conversations. Or she'll ask about Bob Marley. The other day, Mom, where does Bob Marley live? Well, hmm. he used to live in Jamaica, but now he's kind of in the stars. You know, because yeah. You know, the concept of life and death and what happens afterward, I'm not going to say what's definitive about it because I want her to just, you know, figure that out for herself. Um, So, you know, it's not the concept of heaven or hell or anything like that. I Who knows? So, um, but she asked a lot of questions very similar to that. And, but I I talked to her matter of factly about it. um, And I'll just say, well, you know, my, my grandmother died and she moved on and she left her body. And, um, and sometimes my daughter gets these big wide eyes and it it freaks her out a little bit. Like it, it seems like, well, what is that? What does that mean? She's not here anymore. Uh, and then sometimes she just accepts it and like, Oh, okay. And then she'll go back to something else, you know, but she'll, she'll constantly bring up death and is trying to understand it. And sometimes I look at it and I'm like, you know what, kid, I think a lot of us are still trying to understand it ourselves. So Yeah. Yeah. So, and Jim, well, what's your experience with your? I think your daughter is like twelve, right? She's she's twelve. It it doesn't come up a whole lot with her, but uh, the closest experience she has uh, up until recently, which I didn't get to be a part of because it was with uh, her mom, and since we're split, so I, I wasn't part of that when her uh, granddad died. But uh, the closest part I have is when um, we we lost a cat, and so she was just kind of like, uh. Okay, so he's just gone now. She didn't really – the, the logical connection was there. It's like, okay, so our cat's no longer here anymore. She understands that the cat's not coming back, but I don't think it quite made that emotional connection just yet. Not for her. She was, um, I think, about six or so, but uh, she, it wasn't there yet. She wasn't just making that connection, and it, there wasn't really a whole lot to talk about. I didn't feel like I should – try to force any issues on her or anything like that i figured when she's ready to talk about it she'll talk about it but uh, it was nothing like uh, with me when i was younger with having parents who didn't talk about it or hmm. were heavily making fun of issues or there was always something that was just not sitting right there was 
there was a lack of communication all the way around. But there's none of that here. But I'm trying to talk about this with my daughter. It's well, when she's ready to talk about it, she'll start asking questions about it, and I'll just go from there. So. Yeah, I think I think um, you know what you said, Melissa, about um, you know sometimes we have to just be honest and say mm-hmm. we don't know. I we don't have right. all the answers. You know, right. Um, right. maybe you know you're gonna do something to help figure out <laughs> those answers. Right. <laughs> um, and so I think it's it's nice to let them know that uh, you know we're fallible, we're imperfect. Right. And, um, and yeah, we don't have all the answers, but you know, that's the excitement of life. That's the adventure of life. You can look for the answers together and, and, you know, learn together. And, uh, and I think so many parents feel like they have to have all the answers and, and they can't show weakness, uh, or, um, you know, suffering at all. And, um, and I think that's just a very, um, it's a difficult illusion to maintain and it's not necessary. I don't think. No, not at all. Well, and then the other thing I think what I've noticed other parents do, um, and my parents even, they try to skirt the issue. Well, we can't talk about that. I don't, I don't want to scare you about death or, you know, and it's like, so that automatically one is going to get the kid even more interested. And then also maybe instill a fear in them. Like, wait, what, why is that? Why can't we talk about this? What's so scary about it? You know? And, you know, to me, I've, I've always, I'm always about being honest with my children, not filtering my language and, and talking to them as adults, you know, or as they're, you know, cause I have absolute respect for them and treat them as peers, you know, and I'm just here trying to guide them and, you know, show them what I know so far being on this earth 37 years, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, but I, I, I take the conversations with, about death, like I do about, colors, you know, well, this is what this is, you know, and, and it's the same, um, uh, tone of voice that I have with them and I don't have fear when it comes to death. And so I, I try to let them know that, you know, it's something, you know, you might not know everything about, or that might seem sad or it's okay to have a range of emotions, but I'm not afraid of it. And doesn't mean they won't be, but you know, the more I can instill confidence in them to understand something that really nobody knows that much about, um, the better off I think that they're going to be to cope in life with um, other aspects that they don't know much about. So, yeah, I, I, um, I, I did a video on when, when my daughter said that, you know, I did a short video called um, death brings value to life and, mm-hmm. and basically saying how in a way the idea of impermanence, that things are always in flux, always changing, coming into blossom, withering away and dying, um, I think uh, it brings even more value to our lives in that, you know, you know that um, the things that you love and cherish will be gone soon. So why right. not enjoy it to the utmost now and also um, fight even more passionately uh, for the things that you do believe in, for the principles right. that you stand for. Um, because, um, you know, if, if we did not die, (laughs) you know, how, how would we live, how would, how would you measure happiness? You know, if you didn't die, if you didn't like, if things were always, you know, you never had a fear of, uh, of losing things, you know, how do you measure enjoyment? You know, that's the way you measure is by, is by the fear of loss. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. What, What do you think about that idea, Jim? Oh, I think that uh, gives uh, that's what uh, puts value be- the additional value behind everything. It, it, you bring up a point that uh, is very common in science fiction where when people live for a very long time, even if they're not immortal, that there's not the same sense of urgency to accomplish right. certain things. So um, if well, if you take Tolkien's work, he does a lot about uh, death and in, in life in, in his works there. And that comes up specifically if you read the uh, additional tales about uh, the half elves like Elrond and then. But uh, yeah, it, it definitely brings a uh, sense of urgency to get certain things done. And I would like to go back to something Melissa stated about uh, parents. And uh, that's one of the things that I noticed uh, growing up myself was that uh, when, a, when a parent refuses to talk about something or they say, oh, you're not ready, mm-hmm. and they shield the, parent, they shield the kid from it, it oftentimes will do more harm than not, I think. Mm-hmm. Because I remember when I was younger, when when there was a death in the family, it, parents didn't talk about it. It almost gave me the sense that maybe maybe I shouldn't be talking about certain things either. But 
I had other things happen in my childhood that were more uh, physically uh, violent that when I did recognize that there were other things in the in the family that were going on, like great grandmother had passed away, I I wasn't as strongly connected to it. So I think with today, if people are going to talk about something, they instead of hiding from it, they can talk about it, but I don't think necessarily just not talk about it at all. I think it might send mixed signals or the wrong message to a kid to do that. So they do, so if the parents aren't talking about it, maybe the maybe the kid's not going to talk about it. You know, so they they learn through social behavior. They learn by by seeing what mom and dad do versus what mom and dad say to do. Because mm-hmm. mom and dad are there in the moment, their physical tangible nouns right there. They can interact with mom and dad physically and they can see what's going on, but they don't quite they're not quite capable of understanding how to how to process certain information so it's like a little kid if you if you tell a little kid imagine a tree they'll, they'll imagine a tree they can touch a tree they can see it and that's what's out there but if you ask a little kid to explain to you what the color red is they're going to be completely lost they'll they'll show you a, a red crayon maybe but <laughs> they're not going to be able to do much past that but then if you ask them say hey tell me what axiomatic means they're going to be completely lost. It's it's, it's right. a descriptive word. Tan, it's not tangible. They don't have any any um, basis for it. And then to top that, they're still learning how to communicate. So it's it's going to be very difficult if if that sort of a if that sort of a conversation isn't uh, taking place uh, when the opportunity presents itself, especially when children are younger. I think so. Yeah, I. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that idea of um, not talking about certain things. I'm I'm thinking back to my childhood, and um, I don't think there was anything that my parents refused to talk about really. Um, but my um, my mother was saying that when she was growing up, um, my grandfather would tell them that he didn't like to talk about money um, at the table. I guess when they were while they were eating. Okay, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, with, with with me and mine, I guess not really much uh, that I restrict. You know, nothing. I don't think we restrict anything about you know topics to talk about. Um, and, I, and I'm curious about you two. You know, if if in your, you know growing up, did you did you have any any uh, things that um, your parents restricted? Because uh, like Jim said, I think that automatically triggers curiosity in mm-hmm. that particular thing <laughs> right you know it's just like just like when the, when the state makes something illegal you know people are going to want right. to do it even more <laughs> right you know, it's a black market thr- not only a black market a thriving black market <laughs> right and a thriving revenue for the state <laughs> right so yes yeah, right. so, so, so what, what, what about your childhood so curious Oh, well, <laughs> everything was taboo just about. I grew up Southern Baptist, so the that kind of uh, faith religion was very strict. You couldn't discuss music. You couldn't discuss wow. uh, the opposite sex. You couldn't discuss life and death. You couldn't nothing, oh, you know, and, and you had to do as you were told. If you asked a question, you were punished for it. So I grew up in a very restrictive household, and I but I remember being shut down for it on some level and thinking – this doesn't make any sense. You know, I'm asking you guys questions and you don't, you know, and it just was absolutely frustrating, but it didn't turn off the curiosity and it just made me internalize it and go, what's really going on, (laughs) you know? So, um, but everything was off limits. Everything was not allowed to be talked about. You And, and I definitely was talked down, you know, too. like Mm. my parents, they were the authority and I was their subordinate essentially. Um, so there wasn't a lot of room for my brain to naturally discover things without getting punishment for it. So Hmm. yeah, (laughs) almost the opposite of what you, what you grew up with. Danilo. (laughs) (laughs) And what about you, Jim? Any, any restricted topics growing up? Oh, everything was pretty much restricted. So I had a similar experience to Melissa, which is complete opposite of yours, but my outcome, my, the way I decided to pursue things was complete opposite of what she did. So she became curious where I did not, uh, er, I, everything was shut down, but then my dad was a strict disciplinarian. So it was a very hands-on thing. So mm. when long story short, I, I ended up in a fireplace, but that wasn't just a one-time occurrence. So everything was off limits. If I were to ask a question, 
it was a why are you being a smart expletive? Why are you what you know, don't don't challenge my authority. And it now being going on thirty six or going on thirty seven, I've got all these questions that I've been answering on my own. And one of the things that keeps coming up is well, I guess somebody can't teach what they don't know. And so everything was off, off limits. If I question anything, okay, if I even if it was just to understand the process of how something was to be done while he was home, it didn't matter. It was you either know how to do this or you don't, and or I get, get punished. So there was there were no questions uh, hmm. allowed most part, unless he happened to be in a really good mood that day. So very different, very very different uh, outcome from what you had, and just same same lifestyle growing up but uh, grew up roman catholic and no questions were to be were to be tolerated unless it was you know when when dad wasn't home so wow <clears throat> yeah yeah it's really it's really amazing how people you know I was talking this to melissa recently that how different backgrounds uh, people can come from so, such various backgrounds and yet arrive to volunteerism <laughs> and anarchism. Um, right. And uh, and my my, um, my my parents when I started studying this stuff and I started making the website and the podcast and and started speaking out against, I like, say, public school, for example, and they're like, "Why, why are you speaking out? Look, you went to public school and you turned out fine. You're such a nice person. You <laughs> got two beautiful kids. You got a nice job, nice wife. What's what's wrong?" <laughs> um, <clears throat> but. You know, I don't know. Sometimes um, the curiosity, uh, you know, just never gets turned off, and the constant. I saw actually, I saw a great quote today. Uh, I forget who said it, which is um, the first uh, something like the first mistake that people make is that education um, can be finished. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like where'd you get your education in college? Oh, okay, so it's done then, right? Yes. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> um, but. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's it's so important to um, respect, you know, the questions uh, that our children are asking, because um, that is that is a moment when their minds are receptive to new information. They're they're ready to receive, you know, they're ready to form those neural pathways, you know, to make the the connections in their brain, and and to shut that down um, is such a tragic thing, you know. It's it's like. Yeah, it's like you you know, you're actually harming their brain, their, their mental development. Mm, absolutely. You know, you're just shunting it completely. Um <clears throat> and um you know, so many parents complain about their kids, you know, my kid asks all these questions, well, you know, what's that what's that? What's <laughs> but... My son is uh two and he's been everything. Why? Why? <laughs> Why? And I I'll I'll be as patient as I can and to stop him sometimes cuz mommy needs a break. I'll look right at him and go, well, why do you think? And he stops right. and that shuts it off for a little bit. But <laughs> I, so I, I can get pushed to a point where I'm like, oh, I got, you got to stop with the why kid. Like, <laughs> I, I need, I need a minute to just like not think about why, because now I'm starting to question everything all over again, you know? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that's uh, it's, it's, it's still very common as much as I, it's almost like the more I give them answers or have a discussion with them, it just doesn't stop, which is great. But some days I'm like, I need a break. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, I and mean, Jim, your 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 daughter is a lot older than our kids, so I'm sure your experience with those kind of questions are different, right? A lot different. Uh, no, it's about the same. I mean, it was she went through her stage where she, everything was why, why, why all the time, and, and, and I think if maybe if she hadn't have done that, I may not have question myself and, and my own beliefs, trying to understand myself a little bit deeper. I, she had asked one time uh, a string of, uh, of whys, and it just got me thinking about my own childhood. And I wanted, I wish, I wish somebody would have taken the time to answer the questions, it, at least try to answer them as well as I thought I was answering them at the time she had done so. And that would have made the, the whole difference for me, I think, if that had happened, but I didn't get that. So that was a big, that was a big change for me, uh, right around, uh, about 28 years or so. And, um, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm very glad that, uh, that she did that. She lasted in that stage for a little while, but, uh, soon grew out of it. She was into all sorts of things. And then 
she tried to discover the internet, but uh, her mom put a stomp on that. And, nope. So, but she she does other things, and now she's she's all over the place. She's reading everything and answering her own questions. And Google is uh, sometimes too much of her best friend, but uh, she's uh, she's exploring a lot of things and just much better off at her age now than I was when I was twelve. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you you just kind of. Um... It reminded me of something that that another thing that happens if you if you try to cut off your children's curiosity and and uh, and you don't um, at least try to answer their questions when you can is they're going to seek their the answers somewhere else right mm-hmm. from their friends maybe from their teachers and now now that there's the internet <laughs> you know right. if they're old enough they're going to search for the internet um, and um, wouldn't you want to be the first um, you know person to express you know, that the answers to their, or try to answer their questions rather than, you know, have, you know, shut, try to shut them down and, 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 you know, most likely fail and then just redirect their energy towards somewhere else where you won't know right. where they're going to get it from. So, right. So, so wouldn't you want to, you know, wouldn't you want to, uh, um, not mold, <laughs> but just attempt to explain to the best of your ability the world right. around them, right? Because right. they're going to search for it. And now that there's the internet, it's like the whole world is at their fingertips if they can, you know, if they can type or read. Um, and uh, and so I, I think I remember reading how um, they mentioned that grandmothers, you know how like before the internet, grandmothers were in high demand or grandparents in general. Uh, regarding knowledge and wisdom, you know, you go to your grandparents and ask them for something. Right. And, uh, now that there's the internet, you know, it's kind of a little bit less important. Like, why would you ask that? Unless it was like a personal anecdote. But you know, um, for knowledge, you know, it's like it seems like they have kind of replaced <laughs> the need to ask your parent grandparents. Right. <laughs> what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think that's. Um... Well, you mean about the replacing the grandparents? I think that's very, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I can see that. Um, it's uh, funny because my kids don't have any. Well, they have my dad, and that's about it. So, But he lives halfway around, around the world. He lives in Switzerland. So oh, right, right. they talk to him probably twice a week on um you know, FaceTime, but, uh, you know, they, like, I, I'm always encouraging my kids to like, well, especially if I don't have the answers, well, let's go look it up. I don't even know. So let's look it up, you know, cause my daughter was asking me something about, stars and planets or something. And I didn't, I was like, you know, I don't even know the answer to that. Let's go, let's go check mm-hmm. it out. You know? So we got right. on Google and, and explored that. And, um, we're constantly like looking into books or I'm asking them ideas or, you know, we're constantly looking at different ways, um, to explore that. But funny enough, she, regardless of all the, all the ways that she, we're trying to explore it, when she gets on the phone with my dad, she'll ask him the same question. It's <laughs> kind of like she wants, um, a different, a different sort of, uh, like maybe a perspective right. or confirmation. Like is, you know, is my mom full of it or what do you have to say? You know, kind of thing. Like, <laughs> I, need, you know, I need a second so, opinion. <laughs> yeah. Which is funny too, because my dad it, sometimes, like, cause he's the one that raised me. And of course, as we got older. He was like, you know, I made a lot of mistakes when you were a kid. I'm like, thanks for that. Um, but he's, he's a lot less, uh, restrictive, uh, with her than he was with me. Um, you know, like he'll actually answer her questions and I'm sitting there looking at him like, <laughs> See, this is what this is, this is what you should have been doing. You know? Oh so, man. Um, and it's actually funny cause he mentioned the other day, he said, you know, your daughter's very rebellious and, and she, and she asked a lot of questions and you were that age, but I didn't let you do that. And, and he goes, but you know, it's good. Cause you want that in a kid. You don't want them to be a subordinate. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That's exactly <laughs> how you raised me. Like she, um, you know, I would have gotten beat if I asked that same question, you know, but, and it's in hindsight, he looks back and, um, it, you know, admits to his mistakes as a parent, which is fine. You know, I mean, we've, we've made, um, what, relationship work between us um but anyway regardless um my daughter has established a relationship with them and 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 she gets information from him um regardless of all the information that's around her at her fingertips you know so i think being the the internet can really add to their curiosity but i i find that children still love to go to a source that know that they know 
um, to ask questions. So grandparents are still relevant. Mm. That's a long-winded answer to your question, Danilo. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hope so. I hope they're still relevant. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, so Jim, what's the, what's your daughter um, and and her relationship with the internet? Well, uh, mostly she just does uh, she does her artwork projects, and uh, she probably churns out about the uh, twelve. Uh, highly detailed manga style uh, pieces of art a week but wow. uh, that's her main thing for it but, uh, you'd asked about uh, about preventing a child or shielding them too much and one of the things that I, I try to encourage with my daughter is, is to help show her to help teach her how to ask questions and verify answers because that right there because I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to shield her for, from everything and I don't want to shield her from everything I just want her to see to, to understand the purpose of asking a question and then being able to verify answers, just like, just like uh, Melissa was doing with, um, she said with her, you said your daughter. Yeah. My daughter, my four year old. Yeah. yeah. Grandparents. And, and so right. my daughter does that uh, a lot too, but she's a little more savvy about it. A little more sly. She, she recognizes it's like, uh, hmm, I just asked her, that, just asked mom that. Better wait till mom leaves so I ask dad that. <laughs> it's just kind of, you know, do I have to do this assignment now? It's like, yes. But uh, but sometimes she'll she'll go through and she'll ask things. And I started getting into this because she's she's very close with uh, with one of her aunts who is uh, only about two years older than she is. And so only two years worth of experience over, over my daughter. And they – ask a lot of questions and find things. And so one of the things that I want to make sure she does is to be able to understand what she's asking so that she could better understand the, the answers that she's going to get. And I think a lot of people answer, ask questions and they don't really understand what they're asking. And this, this goes mostly for adults, but if adults are making these mistakes because they don't understand what they're actually asking, then Children must be doing the same thing on a much greater scale. So the best thing I think I could ever do for, for my daughter is to show her how to ask questions and then verify the answers. Awesome. Yeah. You know, you know, to me, when I tell, tell people about um, my version of homeschooling or unschooling, is um, it's not necessarily the bits of information that's important that we teach our kids. Like it's not, you know, we have to teach them this and that and that. Um, or this dates or that, you know, um, but it's more about encouraging the love of learning and um, the curiosity and helping to make sure that fire is still burning. And, um, mm -hmm. in, and, and I think, and, and like you said, Jim, asking the right questions, right? Because <clears throat> um, if they have that curiosity, it doesn't matter what they do. Um, they will be an autodidact. They will teach themselves anything they need to know um, to survive in whatever circumstance they find themselves in. Um, so, so yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it's all about, um, asking questions. You know, it's not, it's not about, it's not necessarily about finding the answers. It's really just about asking the questions. Um, <laughs> it reminds me of a quote, uh, it's like, um, fools have answers and the wise only have questions. <laughs> exactly. All right. It's not about having all the answers at all. You know, it's, you know, you, you, you can, uh, you, you know, if you can figure things out yourself, you know, like, like Jim, I, I, you always say a lot in the videos about how important it is to understand why this question is important. You know, why do we, why do we need to know how to, you know, the basics of math, right? You go, go all the way back to the basics. Why is that important, right? So to understand the foundations, the principles, right? And that's, um, you know, what I focus on and I think what Jim focuses on in his, um, website as well is, is the principles um, of, uh, of voluntarism and anarchism is it's so important to understand that and um, and so yeah so, so the same, same thing with kids I think we can teach them principles just just things foundational things like that that will carry them much further mm -hmm. in life right than just focusing on the details <laughs> it's not about the details right absolutely I think uh, one of the things that uh, I noticed a few years ago was, it, I think it was a, a skit by Penn and Teller, and they were talking about how if all of the religions in the world were to be uh, removed, 
that uh, it's there's no guarantee that they would come back the same way. But if all the science was removed from the world, that at some somehow, even with different names, the same concepts are still going to be re-explored and rediscovered all over again. And that's something that uh, I think is important because if you teach the you teach the kids how to answer questions and why they answer questions or why they ask the questions, that eventually they will be able to figure out everything that we know, at least in principle, in concept, uh, even if they don't understand or don't learn it in the same order that we may have learned it. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so, so, so let me just um, t- touch on our, our second topic, uh, which kind of relate to death, but uh, letting go of fear and, mm-hmm. and why, why it's important that we should help our kids um, to let go of fear. And, and to me, um, that's also the idea of, um, of, of unschooling, of allowing your children the freedom to uh, explore and to make mistakes and to fall and to just um, get dirty <laughs> um, and, and to not teach them that, you know, that the world is a scary place, you know, and that and we should live in fear and that we should, you know, fear other people, other kids, other cultures, other religions, um, you know, and, uh, and I think a lot of, uh, a lot of what the state is, is, is founded in fear. State in, statism is founded in fear. Um, you know, fear of your neighbor, fear of another country, fear of another religion, fear of cultures. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think once we, we can help our kids to, to realize that, um, you know, there's, there's not much to be afraid of. <laughs> you know, we live in the most, one of the safest times in history, <laughs> you know, you're discounting war, but just like, you know, in terms of standard of living, health, longevity, um, infant mortality, you know, we are the most um, comfortable, luxurious, <laughs> you know, lifestyle, right? So what is there to be afraid of? <laughs> what, do you, what do you say, Melissa? Well, I actually, you know, it's funny. I think there's a fear is a survival instinct sometimes, you know, um, because I, you know, I talk to my children about, you know, like, you know, well, mom, why, why is there an ambulance and what's going on? Well, that person needs help. Or, um, you know, mom, what if the monsters come in the house? Well, what do you think are monsters? Well, what about big, scary things? And I'm like, well, that is a reality. There are big, scary things out there. I don't want to paint, sugarcoat the world for the, for my kids, you know? Um, and so, but it's, if I can teach them what is something to just like, you don't have to, you can use your fear to protect yourself, but you don't have to use it to consume yourself, Mm, you know? So you can teach them. There is a balance. There are things like if you see a bear, shouldn't go up and say hi to it, you know, like, (laughs) you you know, you you still need your self-preservation, but I think a lot of people focus on, uh, are totally fearful of things that are, is absolutely unnecessary, like different cultures Mm. or, um, different countries or, you know, and that's, a lot, a lot of the state, you know, oh, here's our two minute hate. We got to We got to prop up this bad guy so you can keep supporting us because we're protecting you from the boogeyman. You know, mm. um, there, there's a lot of fears that are completely unfounded, you know, but there are fears that are important to acknowledge, you know, like, you know, you know, um, you know, like, uh, let's see my daughter, they, they love tinker toys and, um, my, my kids, I have guns in the house. They, they know what guns are. I was raised with guns. It's a generational thing. Um, <clears throat> my daughter likes to build guns. She likes to build rifles so she says with her tinker toys and uh one day i said well you guys we're gonna go to the park let's get ready to go then she sat down she got her shoes on everything and she built her her uh a rifle to take the the park and she goes mom we're gonna be okay we don't need to be afraid of the park because if we come in if we if we if we come across monsters um i'll have my rifle with us and so and i thought that was like, really smart of her because she, she she does talk about monsters constantly and you know sometimes i'll say well if they come into the house mommy's just gonna shoot them you know like don't worry about it like, I, I love that take care of it. Yeah, you just take care of it you know it's nothing to let yourself be consumed by but right. so now she knows that there is danger out there but you can be smart about it, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's where I come from with it. I, I like the fact that you bring up the idea that the fear seems to be kind of over sensationalized, almost as if it's blown out of proportion with yep. the way it's it's handled in society. And I think that uh, there's nothing wrong with fear. I think fear is healthy. But I also think that uh, fear is there's so much emphasis put on it that uh, it, it becomes a problem and 
that was my go-to thing as a kid was to try to logically deconstruct as much of the situation as I possibly can to think of every possible scenario that might happen with with the way my dad might react and to do as much as I possibly can pre- preemptively to give him no ground whatsoever to do anything to me. Mm-hmm. But it was never enough. However, right. I never stopped those lessons. I never stopped working with those lessons. And I just went forward with it. And then it was years later, I rediscovered uh, one of the, my favorite shows as a kid, who's was uh, Doctor Who. And when I came across a specific episode with uh, the fourth Doctor, uh, Tom Baker's character, at the time, it was, uh, nothing is inexplicable, only unexplained. And I tried to always understand every single situation I was in so that I could, so I could just break it down. If I can understand it, then I could probably find some sort of a solution to it before it actually ever becomes a problem. And so I always, for the longest time, was working at a disadvantage, almost like a, like a negative 10 handicap if I was on a golf course, if that's even the right term. I don't know. I don't play golf. so um, <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play golf either. <laughs> I, w- I would try to figure these things out. And, it, and when I realized that things are much simpler than they really are made out to be because fear just clouds everything. Mm. I was just like, okay, that's it. That, that, that's all there is to it. What was I thinking beforehand? And the thing is, I wasn't thinking beforehand because I was too busy trying to cower and stay out of everybody else's way. And that that's not okay. That's not okay for anything. That's not okay for, for anybody, any kid, any, anybody. And then when you get into like what you were saying, Danilo, about government being rooted in fear, well, that's all it is. It, it, all government is rooted in fear because it's it's if it's not well we need to raise this army because the barbarians over there are going to get us or it's it's now we have to pay our taxes because the IRS agents are going to get us yep. and everything it's be afraid be afraid be afraid be afraid but then then what about what about a revolution what why not why not revolt now oh, because we have to, because we're afraid nobody wants to be the first casualty in any of these conflicts but the thing is, is I don't think anybody actually has to be a casualty necessarily. All they have to do is expose the expose the violence that's inherent in whatever it is that they're dealing with, bring that to the forefront, call its bluff, or at least expose it so that enough people can understand what it is that they're dealing with and stand up and say, okay, now it's now it's 50-50. Everybody's divided. Do we really want to do this? And then just to actually go back sit down and talk things out. That's, I mean, that's all it ends up being with, with every situation where fear is involved in. So it's, even if it's not us versus someone else, it's maybe us versus nature, us versus, us versus ourselves. But it's always, we, if we can find that fear, then we can understand, hey, look, this is where the fear is coming from. It's not because these people speak a different language. It's because we don't understand what they're saying. It's not because these people are different color. It's just because it's not as familiar to us. So that's what, if we can just take a moment and see what, see what the fear is rooted in, then that can change everything. But it takes a long time to, to learn that lesson. And if mm-hmm. we start younger or start sooner with our children, I think that will make the difference between another generation of, of apathetic or rah rah we have to vote for this party over here and right. a generation of purely voluntarists who understand um i'm sorry did you say i need to pay a tax on that no <laughs> <laughs> yeah it encourages the non-compliance yes right um uh, you, you reminded me of something that i think you say often uh, jim in your videos which is um uh, fear is rooted in ignorance and I, I think, uh, you know, that's so true that, that we are often afraid of the things that we don't know, right? Like Democrats are afraid of guns, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, kids are afraid of monsters, but, you know, you look under the bed, there's no monster. All right. So now I know there's no monster under there. Or, you know, if you have a, you know, you teach a kid self-defense and they're like, if the monster comes, you can defend yourself. Okay. So why should I be afraid? Right. Um, right. <clears throat> or. You know, what are those things in the sky? You know, they look scary. All right, let's look it up. Let's let's look at where there's stars, there are planets. <laughs> it's a Milky Way. Okay, so then I know what that is. So, so knowledge and awareness 
automatically dissipates fear and and i think um you know that's that's the constant uh, that's the constant path of the seekers of knowledge of the lovers of knowledge is um you know trying slowly to um dispel fear which which it, it seems like a lot of um dogmatic beliefs like religious beliefs and like statism um it's like don't be curious about things don't don't try to understand you know people who live in the middle east we just don't like them you know right they're our enemies don't try to figure them out at all <laughs> right um you and know, don't ask why. Just go with it. Don't ask why. Yeah. Don't. Don't. Mm-hmm. Um. You know. Don't question God. Don't question right. what's in the Bible. <laughs> Just do what it says. Right. You know? Don't worry about why. <laughs> right. Uh, and so I think uh, the people who are actually, um, you know, they, they're humble enough to say, "I don't know," and I want to figure out why. Um, those are the people that are trying to dispel fear in the world, and that's a beautiful thing. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if we can encourage that in our children, um, the future will be a much brighter place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, um, uh, with fear, you know, like I said, I think there's a balance, you know, and, um, it, 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 it gives them a sense because the world we live in is the world we live in. And in some ways it's pretty amazing. And in some ways it's pretty fucked, you know, like there's, there, there's a lot of things that are going on. And I think it's always important that your children have a balance of that awareness so that they are able to, um, believe in themselves to handle situations and handle life and, and, and be given tools to face, um, you know, face their fears or face challenges. Uh, and, and that can only strengthen them to be, um, uh, more independent, you know, and, 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 and follow the crowd less and just go along with, oh, because well, they said so, you know, like, I, I think that if you can encourage your children to the awareness of the realities, because they're not always nice, um, but nothing's totally hopeless. And, and there are ways that you can navigate this world and live a good life, you know, um, which is instilling principles, you know, that that'll help a lot. So yeah, I think it, it, fear is definitely a balance uh, for them to grasp, but for them to grasp with tools that we give them, and hopefully that they get from other people too. You know, on their on their constantly questioning. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's uh, in the words of Bill Hicks, the choice between fear and love. That's it. <laughs> you know, um, and uh, I mean, I mean, like, like you said, Melissa, there's there's a place there's a place for fear. But and as Jim said, it's it's often over sensationalized, mm-hmm. um, and um, and people can get carried away with that. And when you do that, when you get carried away in fear, that's when um, oppressive regimes come in. That's when dictators come in. That's when wars are justified. You know, that's when <clears throat> um, you know even more law, even more taxation is justified um, because we are afraid. Right. right. Uh, people, you know, the 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 logical, rational centers of the brain do not function when you're afraid at all. <laughs> you know, unless you're like a, a kung fu master, martial arts expert, you know, and, and your your moves are like on automatic. <laughs> Most people are not automatic. Uh, they don't function logically when they're afraid. Right. Not at all. Not at all. I, I think that's something else, too, is when the whole fear aspect, it gets people to not look at other people as people. And one of the things that I go on about a lot in my work is that I will, I will ask people, I say, you place value on yourself, right? Well, I'm pretty sure that everybody else who's alive places value on themselves too. Even though you might not be able to, to understand in what ways they value themselves, they still place value on themselves if they're going to get a job and or working the land or whatever is the, whatever it is that they're doing to maintain and improve the quality of their lives they're still going to go through and, and and try to make that happen all we have to do is remember that and when we when we don't rem- remember that we end up not thinking of them as an actual living being a human being we think of them as something 
oh, they're just a Republican or they're just a Democrat. They're just a, they're just a Middle Easterner or they're just a Brit or they're just a Canadian or they're just a Chinese or whatever. And, and then it gets in. And then from there, it just gets even worse and it becomes even more derogatory and demeaning until before you know it, we're slinging insults and then we're slinging bullets. And I, I think that right there is the most dangerous aspect of, of fear, especially if it's if it's sensationalized. Mm-hmm. So. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so, so is there anything else, uh, Melissa, you wanted to add before we, uh, before we wrap, wrap up um, about fear and death relating to our kids? <laughs> no, I think this, well, I just wanted to say that this, you know, this, this was a conversation that you and I were having and it sparked the topic because our daughters are very similar with what they're going through and what they're asking. And we were talking about death and that sort of thing. And Hey, this would make for a good podcast. So, <laughs> uh, but I wanted to, um, go back to the fear of death. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people's unfounded fears come from. They're terrified of death. Uh, and, and that's why, um, you know, Fear can be sensationalized because, well, if this doesn't happen, we're all going to die. Or if this doesn't happen, you're going to die. Or, you know, and it, and it, aside from self-preservation and not wanting to die, people tend to think that a lot of things are going to kill them and it's, it's not going to, you know, like, um, and so I think it's, I think it's very important to establish, um, questions, especially regarding death, you know, and even if you don't know the answers to not shy away from that conversation with your children, um, I, and I remember in that conversation I was telling you about uh, that I was uh, studying one of my favorite philosophies are, are, is the Stoic philosophy and uh, that Seneca quote that I, uh, I think I totally botched it when I was trying to <laughs> quote it to you. But um, I was I, I just I have it in front of me and it says, refuse to let the thought of death bother you. Nothing is grim when we have escaped that fear. And that's pretty much how I try to teach my children to move past fear, you know, and, and especially with death too, because there are so many unknowns. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Death is, um, yeah. I mean, they say, I hate the phrase death and taxes, you know, there's nothing, what is it? Um, there's, there's nothing certain except death and taxes. Death and taxes, right. <laughs> um, I think a bureaucrat made up that, <laughs> that saying. Right. <laughs> We're going to normalize this extortion. I know, right? Don't, right? Re- don't resist you to it. Accept it. You can't escape it like you can't escape death. Don't resist it, you pesky volunteers with your logic and your reason and your arguments and stuff. And your principles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, so many, so many things uh, that people do are out of fear of death. Um, like, you know, like, like I, I, I'm, I hang out a lot in the woods with uh, some other homeschooling families and uh, you know we carry you know um, a lot of the kids have knives it's like Swiss, Swiss army knives um, uh, some of the kids have even bigger knives than that um, and then uh, we, we have a fire usually we cook out, outdoors but we also sometimes they just make a fire so the kids can play <laughs> around the fire and they love it you know they feed the fire and they just it's just fun for them um, right. and uh, and I could see how that kind of environment would frighten a lot of parents, um, and um, and it's unfortunate, you know, because you know so many um, so many experiences, so many wonderful experiences a child could have um, if it wasn't for a frightened parent um, <laughs> that kind of paralyzed their own child, um, and 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 then of course you know all the fear and insecurity that the parent has gets transmitted to the child, and mm-hmm. so they grow up to be fearful and timid. Right and insecure and 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 then it's just it's just a cycle you know and so i think one of the things as peaceful parents and and homeschoolers is to break that cycle first of all it's a cycle of violence and then it's also a cycle of fear and um and so i think that's what i've uh i've been on my path towards striving to do um, and, um, and yeah, being around these families, going outdoors, just, just doing stuff that kids should do, you know, it's like, they love yep. it. They love being outdoors. They love, um, you know, climbing on trees and climbing on rocks and sure they could fall and they do fall and then they get hurt and then they get back up and they continue. Right. Um, <clears throat> like my, I was talking to one of my friends, um, this other father and he's like, um, your daughter falls a lot. Um, is that because she's in ballet? That she falls a lot, and I was thinking, and I was thinking, no, I don't think it's because of that. I think it's because she's very adventurous, and she does mm-hmm. she she takes a lot of risks. 
She yep. tries things um, that maybe other kids would not try. And so right. she falls a lot. And it kind of reminds me of like maybe an entrepreneur or an inventor. How many times do they fail before you actually succeed? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you can't measure success based on how many times you fail, right? Because mm -hmm, if, exactly. that the, if that were the case, nobody would have invented anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's only, it's success only comes to the dogged, to the persistent, right? To the right. stubborn people that say, you know, it's, it's like, it's like uh, I forget, it's, it's a proverb. It's like, it doesn't matter, you know, if you fall seven times, just make sure you get back up eight times. <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's my experience. Uh, with fear, with with being outdoors, and just um, you know, um, yeah, like my my friends, they think I'm the most permissive parent out of the group. Like like they never see me angry, they never see me shouting at my kid. Um, you know, don't don't do that. I mean, or, or like you know, if, as long as they're not hurting anybody. But you know, don't get off get off that or whatever. Uh, I, I very rarely say that. I don't like to say that. I like to you know, because another thing that happens with kids, I think, when they when they're outdoors and they're allowed to be free, is they can explore. The limits of their um, physical body, right? Um, and and I think my daughter is really aware of the limits of her physical body, um, because right. like like just give you a quick example. Um, I, we were at gymnastics, and the teacher was telling me about my daughter, my four year old, and saying how you know she would tell her, ask her to do something, and then my daughter would look at the the thing that she wanted her to do, and, and she would immediately conclude, you know, I can do that, and she does it. Or sometimes she's like, No, I can't do that. So and, and it kind of impressed her in the sense that she knew the the limits of her physical body, which right. is pretty awesome, pretty interesting yeah. for a four year old, you know. Yeah. Um. So so yeah. <laughs> so um. So Jim, yeah. Any any uh any closing thoughts on on um, fear or death? Or... Oh, I I think if we just make the time to be patient, patient and patient, especially with uh, children, that I think uh, will. Everything will work itself out. We just have to, we just have to be patient and remember that communication is extremely difficult for adults. Which means that if it's that's the case, then children are still learning, and they're learning the basics. So right. patience, patience, and patience, and then maybe a little bit more, and we'll be okay. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and and uh, you know, Melissa, you brought up stoicism. And yeah, I've been hearing a lot about stoicism a lot. Like Nick Hazelton, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him from the uh, Anarcho Yakalist podcast. Mm -hmm. He's also right. on Freedom Fiends. Um, he's he's big into stoicism as well, and he talks about it on his podcast as well. So um, it's something I find very a common thread with a lot of uh, voluntarists, um, different voluntarist anarchists that I discuss. They're like, oh yeah, and then then I've been getting into stoicism. I'm like, funny, because that's what I've been into as well for the last uh, couple of years. So. Yeah, any any specific popular. any specific books that you can recommend or or specific philosophers? Oh, Seneca is one of my favorite. Um, I think I've read him more than. Yeah, I think Seneca. Uh, yeah, I, I have to say that I've been stuck on Seneca for a good <laughs> year now. So, yeah, cool. he's definitely. And then uh, you can always look at you know if you can Google it, you can look at Seneca and the teachers he came from, or the teachers that came after him, and mm. and everyone has their own thread or you know, interest of, uh, stoicism, but it's good stuff. Yeah. I've studied a lot of philosophy, Eastern Western philosophy, but not too much of, of, uh, stoic philosophy, some ancient Greek, you know, Plato, Aristotle, um, uh, Socrates a little bit, but, um, <clears throat> so Jim, any, any, um, any experience with stoicism? Any, have, have you read any of that? I can't actually tell you. I know what that is. Uh, directly a lot of the stuff that i understand is stuff that i've been able to think about and figure out on my own uh just like non-aggression i had no idea that's what that was called until somebody pointed it out that's what i was actually talking about but um i guess to add a, any sort of material in there that would be helpful for uh, parenting uh one of the things that i've been exploring for the last few months is uh, non-violent communication uh particularly the series by dr marshall rosenberg i've been going through some of those um, and that's that's been fantastic. That's helped out with uh, my everyday normal life as well as uh, with my daughter and just any other people I come in contact with. I think that actually be really really great for uh, children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. That's, maybe that's a great topic for the next time. I think we can, <laughs> maybe we can explore that in depth. 
Um, but um, awesome conversation, uh, everyone. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks a lot, Jim, for coming on as a guest. Um, so if anyone wants to help us out, um, we do not have a separate Patreon for Non-Aggression Parenting Podcast. Maybe we should make one, right? <laughs> um, but uh, you can always donate to mine um, and help me out uh, through Patreon, PayPal, or Bitcoin. Um, PayPal uh, or uh, Patreon.com slash Peace to help me out. And it will help um, Melissa and I with this show because um, <clears throat> you know we love spreading... Um, the ideas of homeschooling, unschooling, and peaceful parenting with as many people as possible. And uh, if you can help us out, that will give us more encouragement to do so and bring on other fascinating guests like Jim here. So, uh, so yeah, if, if you enjoy this content, you find value, trade value for value. Um, and uh, that's, the, uh, that's the capitalist way, right? Vote with your dollars or vote with your Bitcoin. Either way, just v- voting is better than voting <laughs> Democrat- Democratic voting. <laughs> or you can vote with your feet too. That's good too. Um, <laughs> all that, all that is, uh, does not require violence. So two thumbs up. <laughs> so uh, awesome conversation. Everyone, thank you very much, uh, Jim, for coming on the show. So this- yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, so this is um, the Non-Aggression Parenting Podcast. Um, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you will receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day.